from Florence, Italy. The city of inspiration for sculptors in ages past and for centuries to come. You're listening to The Sculptor's Funeral. Good day to you all. Welcome to The Sculptor's Funeral, a podcast produced in the heart of Florence, where all the great sculptors are dead. And I don't feel so well myself. I am your host, as always, Jason Arkles, a sculptor and teacher, and now a podcaster for whatever that's worth. And today, instead of focusing on a single sculptor, we're going to survey several sculptors active in Paris in the 1860s and the 1870s, around the same time that Jean-Baptiste Carpeau had his professional career. Over the last few episodes, we've examined Carpeau's work, and we've used him as one example of the great diversity of sculptural style that blossomed in the wake of late Romanticism, the influence of teachers like Francois Rude and writers like Émeric David, and the pushback the Academy was starting to feel due to these influences. But if we really want to understand the blossoming diversity, this veritable renaissance of figurative sculpture that occurred at this time, we can't just use one sculptor's work to illustrate it. And so we're going to take a wander through the Paris of the Second Empire and see what several different sculptors were up to. Now, we saw in earlier episodes how Francois Rude developed his own personal technique of a mathematical, optical approach to working from a live model, which he seems to have passed on to Carpeau. Well, that's just one example of a sculptor developing new working techniques at the time and influencing the subsequent generation. This occurred repeatedly. Other sculptors of Rude's generation were experimenting in various ways to render the human figure away from the academic formulas of the Greek ideal. Probably the most influential sculptor after Rude in his generation was a man named Albert Ernst Carrier Bellius. Now, Carrier Bellius trained early on as a goldsmith, and then he went to study at the Ecole de Beaux Arts under David Danger. The word most associated with the work of Carrier Bellius is versatility. He was a very competent sculptor in everything, from statuary to architectural decoration to jewelry, small bronze statuettes, portraiture, you name it, Carrier Bellius did it, and he did it very well. While he had many works we might call notable, he had no clear masterpieces. However, he had significant influence over several artists and styles of the next generation. Much of his work can be seen as completely academic and classically influenced, and at the same time oozing with sensuality in a way that seems to have been taken up by many sculptors later on. It's like he found the secret formula of just enough sensuality from the Rococo, tempered by both the best of what academic classicism can be and a healthy dose of modeling from life. A good example of this is his Sleeping Hebe, or Sleeping Ebbe, in which we find an austerely classical theme rendered with the simple grace of a naturally posed model, who is as idealized as much as she is observed from life. It's academic work, but it's academic work at its very best. And when I look at Carrier Bellius's statue called Bacant with a Herm of Dionysus, a work in marble that was completed the same year Carpeau started work on his famously sensuous group The Dance for the Paris Opera, when I look at that work of Carrier Bellius's, I am utterly convinced that Carpeau's group was largely inspired by it. In Carrier Bellius's statue, we see a familiar sensuous nude Bacant in a wonderfully naturalistic pose, complete with the toothy smile that was to become the hallmark of Carpeau's work. I've known this work by Carrier Bellius since I first saw it in Paris over a decade ago, and it was only recently I realized that it was created before Carpeau's dance. I had always assumed the opposite, and I'm surprised I've never seen it discussed in relation to the debt so obviously owed to it by Carpeau. And while the work of Carrier Bellius's prolific career became a bit of a pattern book for later sculptors, his influence was often more direct. Of the many sculptors to have studied or worked for Carrier Bellius, one was Alexander Foglier, who studied under him in the 1850s and who we'll soon hear more about. But beyond Falguier, Carrier Bellius's most famous protege was a former student of the Petite Ecole, a decorative modeler who blossomed under Carrier Bellius during the six years he spent as his assistant in the 1860s, and this man's name was Auguste Rodin. 
And then there were other sculptors of the generation of Francois Rude and Carrier Belleuse who pursued other branches of sculpture. Antoine Louis Barry is probably the greatest animal sculptor of the 19th or, frankly, of any century. The same year Rude exhibited his Neapolitan Fisher Boy playing with a tortoise in the Salon of 1831, Barry exhibited a large sculpture of a tiger devouring a crocodile. Barry's intensely naturalistic renderings of animals, whether they were locked in mortal combat or just scratching an ear, they were very popular and, and would influence generations of animaliers well into the 20th century. Like Carrier Belleuse, Barry started his artistic training also as a goldsmith, but developed strong drawing and modeling skills by creating quick sketches of animals in the Paris Zoo at the Jardin des Plantes. His rapid sketching of figures in action and in their natural setting recalls Carpeau's exercises of drawing people in the streets of Rome. But of course, Barry was working in this way decades before Carpeau did. But whether it was of people or of animals, rapid sketching of figures in their environment, the memory training that this pursuit develops, and the aesthetic of naturalism driving these pursuits are a common theme in the middle of the 19th century for any sculptor wishing to break free from the narrow scope of the academy. The work of Antoine Louis Barry has little to do with the work of Carpeau, except in that both were driven by their individual tastes and interests, and both found the means to express their individuality through intense study of nature. And that's the kind of point I'm trying to make with this episode, actually. It's, it's worth pointing out that Although everyone was doing basically the same thing, you know, observing nature and rendering what they saw, they produced a tremendous variety of work. One reason, of course, is that there's just a lot to nature. People, or animals, or landscapes, or botanical specimens, or a thousand subcategories of each of these. Nature seems infinite in its variety. But what is just as infinite in variety is the individual, specific perception of nature that everyone receives in their own way. Two artists can look at the same subject and come up with very different interpretations, and both can be accurate. Any figurative sculpture student or teacher knows this to be true. I mean, just look at the variety of productions in a single figure class where everyone works off the same model. They're all the same, and at the same time, they're all different. We're not 3D printers. We all have different handwriting in our sculpture. We all have different ways to say the same thing. Whenever I hear the old trope that figurative artists are slaves to nature, that immediately clues me in that the person saying it either doesn't understand nature or doesn't understand perception. Being a slave to nature is being a slave to infinite variety and endless challenge. Slavery without limitations, that's hardly slavery. I don't know, maybe they just don't understand slavery. Anyway, we'll get back to this influential generation of sculptors when the sculptor's funeral continues. Many sculptors and sculpture fans listening will be familiar with the works I'm discussing today, but many will not. If you are not, just go to the website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, and in the episode gallery of this podcast, you'll find many images that are relevant to today's discussion. While you're at thesculptorsfuneral.com, you can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, you can listen to every episode of The Sculptor's Funeral for free, and you can leave a comment or ask a question. Okay, this first generation, working along several different avenues of inspiration, the generation of Francois Rude, Antoine Louis Berry, and Albert Ernst Carrier Belleuse, an interesting aspect of their individual successes is that they were all working towards different goals and often in different genres, you know, the figure or architectural decoration or animals, etc. Every once in a while, you would get a student who would study under two different masters and end up with sort of a, a cross-pollinated education. The example of Carpeau studying under both Rude and Francisque Doré comes to mind. Carpeau learned his naturalistic technique from Rude and his anatomy from Doré, both of which skills are crucial to the success of Carpeau's Ugolino. But Carpeau wasn't the only one. Francois Rude had another student who became an accomplished sculptor, Rude's own nephew, Emmanuel Fremier. But Fremier was also inspired by Antoine Louis Barry, and Fremier became a very highly regarded animalier, a genre of sculptor which hardly existed before Barry. 
Fremier's best works are the ones in which he combines animal and human figures, from his playful statue of Pan and the Bear Cubs to his outlandish rendering of a mountain gorilla abducting a sensuous nude female, sort of a precursor for the King Kong myth. There were many other ways students were cross-pollinated, so to speak, by various sources of learning and information in Paris. Now, we've already discussed how a student at the École de Beaux-Arts might join an atelier libre, or a free atelier, a studio not connected to the École, and run by an instructor who, like Francois Rude, may have a very different idea about art than the Academy. But there were other sources, too. There's a large number of figurative sculptors who got their start at the Petite École, the Parisian School for Applied and Decorative Arts. Now, these students were generally sons of tradesmen or, or others from sort of the lower classes wishing to earn the wages afforded to a, a skilled craftsman, but who then showed real artistic promise and went on to study at the École de Beaux-Arts or found other areas of opportunity. Among this group of Petit École graduates, we find Carpeau, Henri Chapou, Jules Dalou, Auguste Rodin, and many, 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 many others. And the whole point to all this is that under the freer atmosphere of the Romantic era of the mid-19th century, there were more opportunities to study under a wider range of influences than ever before. I can think of no two sculptors who studied after 1850 who walked the same path in their education. The lineage of master to pupil, instead of being an orderly orchard of family trees, more resembles a thicket. But Every once in a while, some sculptors would join together in pursuit of similar themes and interests. Maybe one sculptor finds a new approach, and others adopt that approach, and sooner or later, you've got a movement. Just such a group has its genesis in the early 1860s at the French Academy in Rome, the home of the Prix de Rome winners during their stay in Italy. If you remember, Carpeau won the Prix de Rome in 1854, and was there from 1855 to 1860. And just about the time Carpeau was modeling his Ugolino in clay, a few other young sculptors arrived in Rome. One was another Prix de Rome winner, Alexander Falguier, who joined the French Academy after winning in 1859. Falguier, as I mentioned, had worked in the employment of Carrier Bellius while as a student. The other was a young man from a wealthy family named Paul Dubois who had studied only for a single year at the École de Beaux-Arts before he decided to award himself his own Prix de Rome and move there to study independently. Once there, he got to know several students at the Academy of France, and Paul Dubois and Alexander Falguier became good friends and shared the same artistic interests, namely a fascination for the Italian Renaissance. Like Carpeau, these two young sculptors were looking past the classical works Rome offered and were finding inspiration in places not officially approved by the Academy. For Carpeau, his inspiration came from Michelangelo. For Falguier and Dubois, they tended to look towards earlier examples of the Florentine Renaissance, to Donatello, to Desiderio de Settignano, Luca della Robbia, and Verrocchio. A turn towards the early Renaissance really should come as no surprise to my regular listeners. In the past several episodes, we've discussed how the Romantic movement in sculpture was the first European period of art to study the human form away from the influence of classical taste since the Renaissance. So, if you're a young mid-century sculptor living in Italy who wants to do something fresh and new, but is looking for historical precedent or inspiration, of course, you're going to turn to the Renaissance and the time before Michelangelo, before ubiquitous classicism. Now, the results of this interest in the early Renaissance resulted in both Falguier and Dubois producing works for the Salon of 1864 and 1865, which were notably different, enough from the usual Salon offering, that a journalist dubbed them Neo-Florentines. Falguier, in 1864, exhibited a work called The Winner of the Cockfight, and Dubois, in 1865, exhibited a work called The Florentine Singer. Both are statues of adolescent boys, and so both are sort of tied to that genre type exploited by Rude and Dore and Carpeau, you know, with their Neapolitan Fisher boys. But the works of Dubois and Falguier are infused with influence from the Renaissance. 
Foguer's youth is taking a lot of notes from Giambologna's playbook, enacting the pose of Giambologna's Mercury, with a torso and underplayed muscularity similar to Donatello's David. Paul Dubois' Florentine singer doesn't owe much of a debt to the early Florentines in terms of sculptural style, but the evocative subject, that of a, a youth in Renaissance costume, strumming a lute, forever cemented Dubois in the eyes of the public as the leader of the Neo-Florentines. Two things should be pointed out here. The Neo-Florentines did not exist as a group, per se. They weren't like, say, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, who were indeed a conscious and deliberate affiliation of artists with explicit motives and goals. Now, the Neo-Florentines were much more loosely knit. It was more like a train of thought in 19th century sculpture rather than a manifesto. It was a style that sculptors could experiment with and add to their repertoire or discard as they saw fit. Paul Dubois himself stopped producing work in the Neo-Florentine vein in his later career, even if he was never able to shake off the affiliation in the eyes of the public. So maybe it's best not to think of a sculptor as being a Neo-Florentine, but rather a sculptor's particular piece might be referred to as Neo-Florentine. The masterpiece of the Neo-Florentine style was produced about seven years later by a student of Falguer named Antonin Mercier. Mercier exhibited a statue of David at the 1872 Salon that was an instant sensation. For one thing, it competes successfully with the David by Donatello, to which it owes a great deal in terms of composition and handling. It is a brilliantly executed statue and a worthy successor to the line of famous Davids, which include those by Michelangelo and Verrocchio. But on top of that, a statue of the young boy slaying the giant held a particular significance for Paris at the time of its unveiling in 1872. At that time, Paris was still recovering from a small revolution known as the Siege of Paris. In a nutshell, the Siege of Paris went down like this. In 1870, Emperor Napoleon III, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte and the ruler of France during the Second Empire, was captured in battle by Prussian forces, effectively ending the Franco-Prussian War as well as ending the Second Empire. Prussian forces then marched upon Paris and laid siege to the city. Meanwhile, the French government, without an emperor, reorganized into a republic. The Prussians, with their siege, meant to sort of starve Paris into surrendering while Paris hoped to buy time to reorganize its armies across France and allow the siege to take a toll on Prussia's economy. You see, sieges are pretty expensive. Eventually, a treaty was signed, but the war between France and Prussia wasn't the only battle going on. In the power vacuum, in the absence of the emperor, the working class of Paris sought to empower themselves in the new government, which the new republican government resisted. However, the National Guard, which was sort of the local Parisian military force defending Paris, was allied with the struggles of the working class. So what you had were really sort of two governments inside the French capital that were at odds with each other. You had the French National Government, and you had the Paris Commune, or the city government of Paris, each with their own military force. Basically, what happened next was a small civil war which occurred mostly within the walls of Paris, between the French army and the National Guard, the Republicans versus the Communards. The Paris Commune actually took control of the city for a few months, but was eventually routed by the National Army. Now, the most lasting effect of the Siege of Paris was its aftermath. The failed Communards represented a large portion of the population of Paris, and as a consequence, tens of thousands of citizens were captured by the army during and after the fighting. Hundreds were executed, thousands more were imprisoned, exiled, or deported. And outside of that, thousands and thousands more fled France before they could be caught. The consequences of the Siege of Paris and the defeat of the Communards devastated the lower classes of Paris. This was to have a major effect on Parisian society, the arts, and European politics for decades afterwards. So back to Mercier and his Statue of the David, which was shown in the first Salon after that war ended. David, the small and weak youth, confronting a giant armed with little more than a stone and courage, 
was instantly recognizable as a symbol for the working classes of Paris, fighting bravely in the face of a much larger force. It is exactly the same motive that, several centuries before, had made Michelangelo's David the symbol of Florence, the small city-state bravely standing in opposition to Rome and the might of the papacy. Now, we, we see the sinuous, youthful bronze bodies of Neo-Florentine work crop up again and again through the rest of the century, from Alfred Gilbert to Augustus St. Gaudens. But Neo-Florentinism, arising as it did from the influence of the Renaissance, is just one example of a movement, a, a train of thought, if you like, arising from the influential times, places, and events of the late 19th century. Another art movement, probably the most important art movement to follow Romanticism, occurred as a reaction to Romanticism, and that movement today is known as Realism. So, Romanticism is the celebration of the emotions, of individual creativity, of the drama and power of nature, right? So, Romanticism is the antidote to Neoclassicism, which demanded homage to the Greeks and to the ideal Greek culture represented in all its passionless, noble sentiment. Romanticism is all about passion, expression of the individual rather than of a collective culture. Romanticism is another form of idealism altogether. Well, some artists, starting way back in the 1840s, saw that Romanticism is really just as artificial as Neoclassicism, in a lot of ways. Sure, maybe a Romanticist pays more attention to living models than to the Greek ideal, but at the end of the day, Romantic sculptors are still producing bacchants and mythological heroes and gods and allegorical subjects. Stories, fairy tales. Just look at Carpeau's work. His great Ugolino, for all its power, is a fictional character. His exuberant dance, for all its energy, represents an idea, not a real, tangible person. There really is no genius of dance. He is he's an allegory. He's as fictional as the bacchants who cavort around them. Even, even Carpeau's portraiture is artificial, representing power and title and class as much as physical appearance. Is there no room in art for simple reality? Isn't the pursuit of life as it really is, unadorned with allegory and narrative, at least as noble as an artificial, subjective ideal? Is not the life of a working-class man or a mother of children just as worthy as commemoration as a politician? Well, that's where the realists come in. Now, you can be forgiven if you thought that realism meant uh, sort of a style of sculpting or painting that was seen as more realistic than other styles, like in the way we differentiate between realistic and photorealistic painting. We use the word realism in a lot of different ways. But when you see the word realism with a capital R, it's referring to the 19th century art movement that places the reality of life at the forefront. So workers, mothers, children at play, domestic scenes, scenes of labor at the factory or on the farm, portraits of people you wouldn't look twice at on the street. Realism, capital R realism, is the depiction of you and me as we really are, as we live our lives when no one is looking. That's realism. Now, when we speak of realism in sculpture, one name stands out above the rest. Jules Dalou. Dalou got his start on his own as a young boy, making clay models as a hobby. He had two older sisters, both of whom hung out with a dashing young teenager who was studying sculpture at the Petit École. The sisters invited the sculpture student over to their house one day and showed him the models their little brother had made. The student of the Petit École was so impressed that he not only urged the kid to apply to the Petit École, but he also successfully convinced the boy's parents that it would be a good thing, and their son was a promising talent. That sculpture student's name, by the way, was Jean-Baptiste Carpeau. Over a decade later, Jules Deleu would end up competing for the Prix de Rome as a student of Carpeau at the École de Beaux-Arts in 1865. The two were lifelong friends and Deleu is regarded as the successor of Carpeau's naturalistic technique, itself, of course, based on the technique of Francois Rude. But Deleu was no romanticist. He was from a working-class family, and he was very much dedicated to family life. 
it's where his personal interest lay, and it became the source of inspiration for his early work. He left the École de Beaux-Arts in 1865 after failing to win the Prix de Rome for the third time. He married his sweetheart, and he moved from his parents' house into the house next door with his new bride. He took a job as an assistant modeler in a sculpture company which produced decorative work, and over the next several years produced his own work in his spare time and exhibited his work in the Paris Salon. His work was very well done, but not particularly ambitious or challenging, mostly plump nude bathers and a few mythological subjects of a gentle nature, you know, Chloe and Daphne, stuff like that. He achieved his first success in 1870 with a seated figure of an embroiderer at work, most likely a portrait of his wife. It won Deleu a medal and a commission of the work into marble. So, at the age of 32, the modest career of a modest man seems to have taken a turn for the better. However, the siege of Paris disrupted the life of Jules Deleu, as it did so many others, and sent the sculptor down a path he never would have chosen for himself, a path which would have an effect on the sculpture of an entire nation over the following decades. We'll hear more about it when the sculptor's funeral continues. Hey, podcast listeners, just a quick shout out for my new sponsor. In case you haven't heard the good news, The Sculptor's Funeral is now brought to you in part by Blick Art Supplies, the oldest and largest supplier of professional art supplies in America. Everything a sculptor needs, from your favorite clay modeling tools, modeling stands, armature supplies, clays, plasters, molding and casting supplies, they have it all, and the shipping in the U.S. is free on most items if the order is over $100. And best of all, ordering your supplies from Blick Art Supplies directly supports the Sculptor's Funeral podcast. Just go to the podcast website, thesculptorsfuneral.com, click on any of the Blick buttons you find on the homepage or on the episode pages, and shop away. A percentage of your purchase goes to support the show, and it's very much appreciated. So the next time you need art supplies, click on Blick. And thanks. So Deleuze's success in the 1870 Salon was to be the last bright spot in his life for some time. During the Siege of Paris and in the ensuing rebellion, Deleuze was caught up in patriotic fervor, as were many artists at the time, and he joined the struggle of the Communards, the populist revolt against the newly formed national government. Deleu had actually joined in the defense of Paris during the siege of the Prussians, and thereafter joined the National Guard. During the few months that the Commune ruled Paris before being toppled, Deleu held a few official positions in the Communist government, which meant that when the Commune fell, Deleu was a wanted man. He took his wife and children and went into exile in London. He and his family stayed with an old school friend and painter, Alphonse Le Gros, while Deleu looked for work. He got a job as a sculptor's assistant, but was fired soon after for accidentally spoiling a good piece of marble. Meanwhile, back in Paris, Delu was tried and convicted in absentia and received a sentence of exile for life. Things were not looking good. However, Delu was a hard worker, and he managed to get back on his feet in London, even showing in the English version of the Paris Salon, the Royal Academy Salon. And his work was found to be very popular. He produced several small works for sale in additions, mostly very sweet, calm statuettes of women in domestic and maternal scenes with delicately rendered contemporary dress. No generalized drapery, no pretentious classicism, and seldom does he allow a figure to be nude for no reason at this time in his career. This perfectly suited England's Victorian tastes, but more than the suitability of his work for his new public, Deleu was a fantastic modeler the best in London at the time. Deleu possessed what was then known in England as the French manner. Sometimes it was called Gallicism or the French method. No one in England seemed to know what it was that made French clay modelers more adept than the English, though it was a universally recognized fact. However, though the French were regarded as superior in talent, they were also universally acknowledged in Britain as possessing a very vulgar taste. So for a Frenchman to possess both Victorian English sensibility and French clay handling was a very rare thing, and it was the key to Deleuze's survival in London. I'll give you a short list of titles to Deleuze's works, which will give you an idea of what he was producing at the time. 
There was, of course, his initial success, The Embroiderer, which got him noticed in Paris. But there were also works with such names as Hushabai Baby, The Rocking Chair, Palm Sunday in Bologna, Maternal Joy, French Peasant Nursing Her Infant, and so on and so on. It all sounds a bit sappy, I know, but these are works that must be seen to understand why they are even worth mentioning. Each one is a masterful work, as humble as they are. In his best work, Deleu depicts each scene with absolutely unadorned truthfulness, which has the effect of somehow ennobling the subject, elevating the quotidian act of sewing or nursing a baby into something on which one can contemplate with admiration and empathy, which is precisely the point of realism. By the late 1870s, Deleu was a well-respected sculptor who exhibited regularly and even gained enough clout to land a few official royal commissions, which, in the tightly competitive pecking order of London sculpture at the time, is saying something. Deleu created a monument to Queen Victoria's dead children and also a fountain dedicated to charity. It's interesting to note that Deleu, like many other sculptors, had a slightly different style when working on public commissions. There's a distinctly Baroque strain which runs through much of Deleu's larger works, all the more interesting as Deleu never won the Prix de Rome and hadn't been to Italy. Deleu completed several large monuments during his career, all more or less marked by the Baroque style, and ironically, they are the least interesting works by Deleu. It's when he gives free rein to his keen-eyed observation of simple scenes that he is at his best. And this includes not only domestic figures, but portraits as well. And it's in his portraiture that we can fully see that he is the true pupil and worthy successor of Carpeau. In 1878, just as Deleu's career is really solidifying in London, back in Paris, a general amnesty is announced for those convicted after the siege of Paris. Deleu's sentence is lifted and he's free to return. So in 1879, Deleu uproots once again and comes home to Paris, where he has already been selling quite well, even while he's in exile. The last two decades of his life are occupied with several monuments, including his public masterpiece, The Triumph of the Republic, an enormous sculpture that is basically a, a victory procession rendered in bronze, replete with allegorical figures representing industry and agriculture and liberty and all the requisite allegories, cherubs, animals, and so on and so on. For as complex as it is, it's a wonder that it's so beautifully composed. There's a clarity of purpose to this work that really shines through, that in the hands of a lesser sculptor would be a muddy mess. But the public project nearest and dearest to Deleuze's heart was a monument that was never realized. It was a monument of Deleuze's own imagining, and we only know it through a series of sketch models in clay that were in his studio when he died in 1902. The monument was to be a monument to workers, a true realist subject. We don't really know what Deleu was thinking in terms of general composition and design, but the small rough sketch models of workers toiling in the fields and working in factories and so on, most only a few inches high, are as evocative and earthy as Degas' little wax figurines of dancers, although not nearly as well known. Okay, so I know this episode might seem a bit jumbled. I've discussed a half dozen different sculptors, all who did different things, the late Romantics, the Neo-Florentines, the Realists, but that's sort of my point about this period in the history of sculpture. Sculpture was all over the map. Artistic and aesthetic lineages are a maze of influences and crossbreedings and intermarriages which with each generation, and really with each individual sculptor, produce something new and different. Only this sort of climate of constant change and constant evolution could lead to the dramatic departures of the Impressionism of Rodin and eventually abstraction, which we'll find in the coming decades. But before we get into Rodin in the coming episodes of The Sculptor's Funeral, we're going to take a, a side trip to England. I mentioned earlier that Deleuze's exile to London would alter the artistic fates of a nation's sculptors for the rest of the 19th century. Well, I wasn't talking about France. In 1877, Jules Deleuze took up a teaching position at what might be regarded as England's version of the École de Beaux-Arts, which at the time was called the National Arts Training School. 
He taught there for two years and then took a different teaching job, this time at England's version of the Petit École, known as the South London Technical Arts School. And he teaches there just for six months before returning to Paris. But the effect he had on these two classes of students was to give rise to the last flowering of figurative sculpture in Europe before the advent of Impressionism, Abstraction, and the stylizations of Art Nouveau and Art Deco. And this new sculpture movement, which is known today as the New Sculpture Movement, will be the subject of the next episode. Well, thanks for listening, uh, and uh, thanks for putting up with my rather nasal voice this week. I'm just getting over a little bit of a springtime cold. Anyway, I can't wait for the next episode. The New Sculpture Movement in Britain is one of my favorite periods of sculpture history, and it's one that people seem to know little about. One very cool thing is that immediately after next week's podcast, I'll be spending a few days in London, where I'll get to once again see some of the work I'll be talking about at the Victoria and Albert Museum, as well as see some of my old friends. I might even get up to Cambridge to the Fitzwilliam Museum and check out these uh, so-called Michelangelo bronzes for myself. Okay, so uh, don't forget that you can listen to the entire archive of The Sculptor's Funeral at thesculptorsfuneral.com. You can subscribe to the podcast and receive automatic downloads of the episode as they air on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your internet audio. And if you go to iTunes, don't forget to rate the podcast and even leave a quick comment or review of the show. That's actually a pretty important way that the show can be heard by more and more sculptors like you. The more notoriety the podcast gets in the reviews, the higher the ranking on the iTunes podcast page. It really helps, so thanks for taking the time to rate the show if you choose to do so. Come and join the conversation at the Sculptor's Funeral Facebook group page. Ask me a question, leave a comment, post a link, tell a joke, whatever you like. Thanks again for listening, and have a great and productive week.